this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to Blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at Suzuki's all-new RM250 for 1986. 86 is kind of an interesting inflection point in motocross history. This is the year that, in America, we instituted the production rule, meaning that all the motorcycles that were being raced on the professional circuit had to be start at least start out as a production machine. You were allowed to do some, you know, minor updates. You can certainly port the motors, uh, do a few things there to get a little more better performance, modify the suspension slightly, but you had to basically start out as a production bike. You no longer could have a machine that bore no resemblance to the uh, standard machine that you or I could buy. So it was really important that the manufacturer started producing, you know, more competent machines for, for the race teams to be, you know, at least on somewhat of a level playing field. This year in 86, Suzuki came out with an all-new machine. Uh, this is the first year for the power valve system on the RM250. It also is the first year for the second generation of the quote-unquote full floater, although this design really has nothing in common with the original full floater. Uh, it's really full floater only in name. It's much more uh, similar to like a Honda ProLink or something at the time. That said, Suzuki did pull out all the stops this year. It was a complete redesign of the chassis, the motor, the suspension, everything. Unfortunately, as you'll see in the video, it didn't turn out to be the most successful redesign. This bike was not particularly competitive this year. Really, Honda was by far the best bike here in 1986. Suzuki did put a lot of effort into this machine, but it just didn't really show up on the track, unfortunately, uh, to any great extent. It was a bit of an off year for Suzuki. If you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. I've done retrospectives on many other motocross, off-road, and ATV models. You'll find uh, shootouts, uh, history of several models, including the KX500, the CR500, and many other models on my channel. If there's something you'd like to see me do in the future, you know, drop me a line here. I'll leave a comment in the comment section below. And if I have the uh, research material, I'll certainly look at doing that in the future. Uh, if you'd like to support what I do here at the Motocross Vault, I do have Motocross Vault merch available. I have uh, several designs from all the manufacturers, off-road motocross ATV designs available uh, in shirts and t-shirts and mugs and stickers, all that kind of stuff. And if you'd like to support what I do here at the Motocross Vault, I'd certainly appreciate you taking a look at that stuff. I'll put a link in the description below and also a card here in the video if you'd like to click on that directly. So here, without further ado, is a look back at Suzuki's all-new 1986 RM250. The late 70s and early 80s were a great time to be riding RMs in the 250 division. Starting with the introduction of their first RM250 in 1976, the yellow machines earned a well-deserved reputation for being some of the best all-around machines available in the 250 division. The middleweight Suzukis were not always the best in any one category, but they excelled on the track by being well suspended, good handling, and easy to ride. In 1981, the RM250 stock took a major leap forward with the introduction of a groundbreaking all-new rear suspension system. Coined the full floater, the RM's new suspension did away with the laid-down dual shocks in use since 1976 in favor of a far more complicated single shock design. The heart of the new full floater was a unique system of linkages and pull rods that isolated the shock from the chassis at both the bottom and top mounting points. This allowed the shock to quote-unquote float independently from the rest of the machine and provided superior tracking in the rough. The revolutionary system proved to be an immediate success, and riders of all skill levels praised the full floater for its incredible ability to smooth out the track. In 1982, Suzuki added a rocket motor to the mix, and the RM250 proved to be nearly unbeatable. The RM's new liquid-cooled mill hit hard, revved fast, and pulled to the moon. Its combination of mega power, lightweight, sharp handling, and flawless rear suspension dominated the charts, with Suzuki once again claiming the crown of best 250 in the land. In 1983, the competition caught up with Suzuki fumbling its horsepower advantage. The new RM was lighter, stabler, and even better suspended, but changes aimed at broadening its power band ended up neutering its blistering performance. The new bike was easier to ride and still competitive, but many found its new mellower personality a disappointment. The 1984 season brought with it another all-new RM250, this time with a blue frame and updated work styling. The redesigned machine featured an all-new chassis, beefed-up suspension, and a refined version of the 83 mil. The updated motor gained a larger airbox, new porting, and a revised exhaust in search of the 82's lost horsepower. While this yielded a 1.6 horsepower gain on the dyno over 83, it remained far short of the output delivered by its top competitors in 1984. All three of the other Japanese 250s outmuscled the RM, and it remained a great suspended bike in need of more horsepower. A front disc brake and a coat of silver paint for the motor were the biggest changes on the RM in 1985. 
Another retread of the Mellow 83 mil yielded predictable results, while the innovative but complicated full floater rear suspension continued to deliver the best ride in the class. With good handling, excellent suspension, and an easy to ride motor, the RM250 made an excellent junior level racer, but it was not much of a pro level machine. In 1986, Suzuki knew that they were going to need to step up their game to have any chance of reclaiming their former glory. With the production rule taking effect in America in 86, it would be more important than ever to provide their race team with a competitive machine right out of the crate. In addition to the new regulations being implemented in the United States, legal battles would also force Suzuki to move away from their original full floater design. In 1974, a young inventor by the name of Donald Richardson had devised a rear suspension system for his motocross machine that replaced the dual shocks common at the time with a single damper and a bell crank rising rate linkage. Richardson patented the design and in 1978 entered into a contract with Suzuki to refine and develop his suspension system. In the agreement, Richardson was required to disclose all technical information about the theory and implementation of his rising rate design. In December of 1979, Suzuki declined to exercise the option on his contract and ended ties with Richardson. Two years later, the full floater went into production using several of Richardson's innovations. In 82, Richardson filed a patent infringement action against Suzuki, claiming breach of contract, breach of good faith and fair dealing, and misappropriation of trade secrets. What followed was a protracted exchange of suits and countersuits that would end up with Richardson being awarded 50 cents for every Suzuki sold with the original full floater in the U.S. and $12 for every full floater equipped Suzuki worldwide. Depending on the sales figures, this equated to an award somewhere between $6 and $18 million to Richardson. While this legal entanglement was largely ignored by the enthusiast press at the time, there can be little doubt that it played some part in the demise of the original full floater design. Due to its large size, high center of gravity, and complicated construction, the original full floater would most likely have been displaced eventually, but in 1985, it was still the best performing rear suspension in motocross. With the future of the original floater in doubt, it was decided that the all new 86 RMs would feature a complete redesign of the iconic rear suspension system. By this point in the mid-80s, most manufacturers had conceded that Honda's original bottom link design offered the best combination of packaging and performance in a linkage rear suspension. By placing the linkage below the shock, the heaviest parts of the mechanism were kept low on the chassis, and the linkage mechanism no longer interfered with the placement of the airbox. In 1986, Suzuki moved to a bottom link design, but chose to go with a wholly unique implementation for their linkage. Instead of the traditional set of linkage arms connected to a shock on the swing arm, Suzuki chose to use an eccentric cam to vary the leverage delivered to its KYB shock. This new system was lighter, more compact, and considerably less complicated than the original full floater design. This allowed Suzuki to reduce manufacturing costs, slim the midsection of the machine, and lower the center of gravity on all of its RMs. Aside from the unique linkage, the rest of the second generation full floater was a thoroughly conventional design with a large single Kayaba shock delivering 12 point inches of travel with 17 adjustments for compression and 21 adjustable settings for rebound. For 1986, the KYB damper received a larger remote reservoir to fight fading and a revamp to the valving to work with the all new linkage design. Up front, the 86 RM250 featured a set of 43mm conventional Kiaba forks delivering 11.8 inches of travel. The forks were new for 86, with a redesigned valving system incorporating a blow-off valve to improve compliance on hard hits. A new progressive rate spring was added, and the amount of adjustable settings for compression damping was reduced from 17 to 8 for 86. While updated, the forks damping system remained an old-school damper rod design that lacked the sophisticated work-style cartridge damping system found on the all-new Honda CR250. Paired with the all-new suspension was a completely redesigned frame that was narrower, lighter, and stronger for 86. Constructed of tough chromoly steel, the new chassis reduced the components used in its construction by 50% over 1985. The redesigned frame was more compact and narrower through the midsection by half an inch via the use of oval tubing where the rider gripped the machine. The new chassis was also shorter overall, with the RM dropping an inch of wheelbase from 1985. While the overall look of the arm's bodywork was very familiar, only the front and rear fenders remained a carryover from the year before. An all-new tank offered a slightly slimmer profile, and an all-new saddle carried farther up the tank. Repositioned radiators were mounted lower on the frame, and new shrouds were bolted on to work with the revamped tank and updated layout. Redesigned side plates remained similar in appearance to 85, but featured a revised shape to accommodate the all-new frame and rear suspension system. Bold new graphics and a bright coat of blue paint for the motor finished off the significant visual changes for 1986. 
In addition to the all-new chassis and suspension, Suzuki rolled out the first major redesign of their liquid-cooled 250 power plant since its introduction in 1982. The revamped motor was all new from the ground up and featured Suzuki's first implementation of a power valve system to broaden performance. Suzuki's name for its new system was the Automatic Exhaust Controlled, or AEC, and it consisted of a valve and subchamber built into the exhaust port that allowed the engineers to vary the volume and flow characteristics of the exhaust gases as they exited the combustion chamber. At low RPM, the valve was opened into the subchamber, mimicking the characteristics of a torque pipe to boost low end performance. As the RPMs increased, a governor rotated the drum valve to close off the subchamber, allowing an unencumbered flow of exhaust to the expansion chamber. By varying the geometry of the exhaust system, the AEC allowed Suzuki's engineers to give the arm the power characteristics of two different exhaust systems in one. Unlike Honda's very similar ATAC, the Suzuki design did allow for fine-tuning of the mechanism through the use of an externally adjustable preload spring adjuster. Like the chassis, the motor was narrower for 86, with Suzuki reworking the transmission and clutch mechanism to reduce the width of the motor by 7%. The redesigned transmission featured new ratios and a slightly smaller gear set, while the clutch moved to a rack and pinion engagement to improve action and slim down the machine. Both the connecting rod and coolant systems were lighter for 86, with the water pump adopting a direct drive and deleting two coolant hoses from the 85 motor design. To further boost low end torque, Suzuki's engineers increased the motor stroke for 86 and reduced the size of the carburetor from 38mm to 36mm. The mixer remained McCuney's VM flat slide design, but the smaller size was said to improve low to mid range throttle response. Internally, the new cylinder featured revised porting and enlarged coolant passages for increased reliability. To gain back some of the top end performance sacrificed by the smaller carburetor, Suzuki enlarged the airbox and redesigned the exhaust system. The new pipe was tuned to take advantage of the AEC and reshaped to tuck in better for improved ergonomics. Paired with the new pipe was a redesigned oval alloy silencer that Suzuki claimed was quieter for 86 as well. On the track, the all new RM250 turned out to be largely a disappointment. The redesigned motor failed to deliver on the promise of the AEC and produced a lackluster power band that was both slow and hard to use. Low end torque was all but non existent, despite the addition of the smaller carb, longer stroke, and power valve exhaust. Out of turns, the Suzuki was sluggish to respond, and any sort of deep soil demanded a fan or two of the clutch to get the RM singing. The mid range power was slightly improved, but the RM continued to be out muscled in the middle by the CR and KX. Top end performance was average at best, with the Suzuki pulling farther than the tractor like Kawasaki, but far less enthusiastically than the Honda and Yamaha. At its peak, it gave up over 2 horsepower to the Honda and Yamaha, and what thrust it did have was delivered over a very short burst in the middle. Short shifting or over revving the motor resulted in a significant drop in power, and it was critical to keep the bright blue mill in the sweet spot of its narrow power band to have any shot of keeping its rivals in sight. In stock condition, it was too slow for fast guys and too demanding for many novices. With major motor work, the RM mill could be competitive, but in stock condition, it was by far the most disappointing power plant of 1986. On the suspension front, the RM was once again a serious disappointment. As this was previously the bike's biggest advantage, this setback was doubly disappointing. The new non-floating full floater lacked all of the plushness of its predecessor and was famous for delivering a harsh ride that was panned by all testers. The small bumps and chatter that the 85 RM gobbled up were transmitted directly to the backside of the rider on the 86. Both the damping and spring rates were super stiff, and the rear suspension of the machine only seemed to be happy when coming down from the stratosphere on big hits. Some of this lack of compliance was traced to the new linkage, which suffered from abnormally high drag. The eccentric cam design demanded constant servicing, and if you neglected it, the mechanism became a major hindrance to the shock's action. If you were Bob Hanna, the new full floater probably worked, but if you were the rest of us mortals, the new look rear end delivered back of the pack performance. Up front, the news was not much better, with the revamped forks delivering a similarly harsh and unforgiving ride. This time, soft springs and an overly aggressive damping were to blame for the Kiaba forks' disappointing performance. In stock condition, they hung down on the travel and hammered into a wall of damping force on small and medium sized bumps. This spike in the travel was transmitted directly to the rider's wrists, and the arm was noted for its ability to pump up its rider's arms in short order. The new blow-off valve incorporated into the 86 forks did not seem to activate on anything less than a two-story drop-off, and the bike was only happy when slamming into cliff faces or landing from serious sky shots. With stiffer springs and some fork oil fiddling, they could at least be made livable, but even with these mods, they were never going to be as smooth and plush as Honda's amazing Shawa cartridge units. On the handling front, 
The RM250 was far more successful in 1986. The new shorter chassis turned very well, and the bike's front end could be trusted to hold its line in most situations. The lowered center of gravity for 86 was noticeable on the track, but the bike still felt more top-heavy than most of its competitors. This did not ruin the RM's handling, but some riders did feel it did not flow through the turns as graceful as some of its competitors. High speed stability was much better than on this CR, however, and more than a few riders felt it offered the best combination of turning prowess and fifth gear confidence in the class. The harsh shock seemed to work better the faster you went, and the RM rarely shook its head and generally went where it was pointed. The bike's jumping manners were praised as well, and the RM was more than happy to conquer any gap the pilot was willing to attempt. On the detailing front, the RM needed a bit more fine tuning in 1986. The bars, grips, and levers were all a step behind the best in the class, and more than a few curse words were uttered while trying to remove the RM's infuriating vulcanized throttle grip. The RM's myriad of bolt sizes and inordinate amount of washers also made it more time-consuming to work on than many of its competitors. The brakes were mediocre at best, with the front disc and rear drum barely offering adequate performance. The rubber hose used for the front disc delivered a mushy feel at the lever, and maximum power was well below what was offered by the Honda and Kawasaki. Adding a braided steel line helped with the mushy feel, but even with that upgrade, it was not as strong as the binders found on many of its competitors. The new clutch proved durable, but the engagement was not particularly smooth, and the pull at the lever was too firm for many. The transmission shifted well, but some RMs, including MXA's test unit, suffered expensive transmission failures in 86. The new full floater design did have a lot fewer moving parts to service, but the eccentric cam linkage proved to be extremely maintenance intensive and in need of constant attention. If you neglected to lubricate the cam regularly, then the drag from the linkage had a noticeable effect on the shock's performance. Constant servicing was a must if you hoped to avoid huge amounts of stiction in the rear end. In terms of appearance, the arm was a bit of a mixed bag in 1986. Most riders dug the new blue motor and overall color scheme of the machine, but the bodywork was starting to show its age by this time. Some riders appreciated the unique Suzuki look, but there was no denying that the arm was not as well finished as the 86YZ and CR. Big gaps in the bodywork and oddball shapes for the plastic made the bike's appearance a love it or hate it proposition to most. While this certainly set the RM apart, many riders at the time felt it did the bike no favors in the showroom. Aside from its appearance, the new bodywork was largely an improvement for 86. The new layout was slimmer, and the longer seat made it easier to slide forward in turns. Shorter riders also appreciated the easy reach to the ground the RM's low seat height afforded. While this was a boon to those below 5'9", tall riders found the Suzuki's layout somewhat cramped. The stock seat foam was also given a thumbs down for sacking out quickly and allowing every jolt from the harsh rear shock to make it right to the rider's backside. Many pilots also felt the RM's sit-in ergonomics felt rather old-fashioned compared to the flatter layout seen on sleek new machines like the redesigned Yamaha. Overall, the 86 RM250 proved to be a massive disappointment for Suzuki's fans. The enthusiasm for the all-new machine quickly turned to bitter resignation as the RM's performance deficiencies became readily apparent. After years of dominating the suspension category, the RM plummeted to the bottom of the standings in 86. The new full floater was harsh in action, and the forks were wrist-busting. The new power valve motor failed to deliver on its promised torque, and nearly everyone thought the older and simpler 85 motor was actually better. In the end, it was only the RM's handling that failed to disappoint. Slow, cobby-looking, and poorly suspended, the 86 RM250 stands as the low point of Suzuki's performance in the 1980s. So there you have it. That's a look back at the 1986 RM250, a machine that was... You know, certainly had a lot of potential in terms of how much effort Suzuki put into it. They completely redesigned the bike from stem to stern, but the results on the track didn't turn out to be, I think, what they were expecting. In the 90, 1986 field, this was probably the least competitive of all the machines. The suspension was not very good. The engine was slow. Um, I know a lot of people liked the looks of this uh, era of RM with the blue motors and stuff. I, I certainly liked it at the time. I thought it was kind of cool, but the bodywork I always thought was kind of copy looking. It looked like the, the uh, front fender was more like a duck bill. It's just a strange looking bike in a lot of ways. But again, I see plenty of people online who still like this look. I think it probably depends on whether you were a fan of it at the time. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, when this bike was new, I certainly wanted a Honda or a Kawasaki or even a Yamaha more than this. I, I, I didn't really want an RM at this point. But uh, I think depending on your uh, whether you had one, whether you wanted one at the time, probably uh, changes how you feel about it now. If you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other vehicles I've uh, covered in the past. I have motocross, off-road, ATVs, all kinds of uh, other reviews here on the channel. If you can share on social media, let your friends know. I would very much appreciate it as well. So until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer from the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.